Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called Improve Your Serve. We're talking about how do we serve others? How do we serve ourselves? We're gonna get to that later on in the series. But today, I wanna talk about a serving grace. The grace to serve. The grace to serve. To see this truth, we need to remember that grace is an active attribute of God. Grace isn't something that all churches preach about. I hope you guys know that. Like the grace of God, the goodness of God. The grace is God's unearned favor towards man. It's not a, a, not a lot of churches talk about this topic. But I want to talk to you about this today. That it is God empowering us to live our best life today. If I could explain grace any other way. It's God empowering believers to live their best life today giving us both the desire and the power to do things his way. All right, let's look at this. In Philippians 2.13, it says this, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So God is actively involved in your life to get his mission done on the earth today. Can I just tell you this? God's going to get the job done. God's going to get the job done. He says to Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan, right? He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I'm just going to tell you this today. And this is no shade, no shame. But if you keep saying no to God, he's going to use somebody else. He's going to use somebody else. Because he is going to get the job done on the earth today, all right? So this is how we have a a, a serving grace. It is his power, look at that verse again, it is his power that is working in us to do his good pleasure. It is his power at work in us. It's not my power, it's not my talent, it's not my ability, it's God's power at work through a bunch of broken vessels, okay? It's God's work through a bunch of broken vessels. If you've ever felt that you weren't good enough for God to use, you've missed the whole point of grace. If you think you're really, really good and you deserve God to use you, you've missed the whole point of grace. You've missed it. Either way, if you fall on the left or the right, you've missed it. God's called us to be in the middle. God, I know without you, I am nothing. I fully depend and rely on you. This sermon sparked something in my heart. The month of December, leading up to Christmas, we are gonna do an entire series on grace. Uh, The series is gonna be called Amazing Grace, and that will lead us right up into Christmas. But today, we're not gonna fully talk so much about grace, we're gonna talk about serving, but I wanna look at the life of Jesus Christ. He was full, the Bible says, of grace and what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth and truth, who went about doing good and serving others. And I know that we like to say, well, he went about healing and he was so miraculous, but really what he was doing was serving. He was full of grace and truth, he was full of the power of God, and he went about serving others. Let's take a look at this in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. He says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. I mean, how often do we want to make a reputation? We want to leave our mark. The world's going to remember me for what? He said, left himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and becoming in the likeness of man. And Jesus becoming in the likeness of man was so beneath him. It was so beneath him. But he did it for us, that we could be equal to him, right? 
And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. That's how he served humanity. He served humanity. His whole life was given to ministry, and he exemplified the spirit of humble service. He had, Jesus had the grace to serve. He had the grace to serve. And so I began to ask myself, do I have that same kind of grace? Do I have that same kind of grace to serve? I wanna tell you next week, you don't wanna miss next week. Next week's gonna be great. I'm, I'm really jumping far ahead of my notes and I'm gonna have to say this again later on. Next week, every single person in here is gonna have the opportunity to take a spiritual gifts test to find out what your spiritual gift is to serve the world, not just the church, but the world. And so I'm really excited about that. We've, we've got an online system that everybody at one time can take it. We're not gonna do it during church, but we're gonna give you access to it uh, to find out what your spiritual gift is, to see what God has placed inside of you. And I was actually pretty amazed at how low pastoring was on my spiritual gifts. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it, I'm like, um, it was like the third from the bottom of like 15 gifts. I'm like, oh man, either I need to work on that or I'm in the wrong profession, but it was, it was obvious that pastoring was very low, so was mercy. So I mean, maybe that's why, my mercy gift was like non-existent. <laughs> Point number one, if you're taking notes, write this down, the grace of serving is the grace of serving practically, practically. And here's the thing, we all wanna put other things before being practical because spirituality is so sexy, right? Like miracles are so sexy, are they not? I'm not am I allowed to say that word in church? And no, I'm not? Is that awkward? Attractive. Right, so you see somebody on stage, and I mean, they're singing, they got a beautiful voice, they're all into it, it's attractive. Man, I would love to do that. Oh, so, but did you see them like two hours ago cleaning the toilet before church? Oh, because cleaning a toilet's not sexy. Oh, now let's say that, attractive. Cleaning a toilet's not attractive, mopping a floor is not attractive, but, but the grace to serve is the grace to serve practically in a practical manner. You see your next door neighbor's lawn is getting long. This happened to me. My next door neighbor, he always had his lawn mowed and I'm like, yo, something's up, man. This dude's not mowing his lawn. Maybe his lawn mower broke. So I went over his house, I knocked on his door. I said, dude, I'm not judging you. I'm not upset that your dandelions are blowing into my fertilized lawn. I'm not upset about it. <laughs> but it's not like you to not mow your lawn. And he had his arm in a sling. He's like, I had surgery on my shoulder. I can't, I can't mow my lawn. I said, well, do you mind if I mowed the lawn for you? I didn't realize I signed up for two months of mowing his lawn. Jesus, the lawn anointing. Two months. But come on, somebody. Instead of just dogging the guy, talking bad about him, ha, ah, look at his, look at his lawn and how bad it is, how about we serve practically? It's not like you to be depressed. Can I pray for you? It's not like you to be angry right now. Can, do you need to talk to somebody? You, you're acting in a way that's not normal for you, for what I know you to be. Can I help you? It's the grace to serve practically. Romans 15, 15 through 16 tells us that God gives us the grace to serve. Paul, the apostle Paul was like the living testimony of that. He says this to us in this, in this passage. He says that he was called to be a public servant, to fulfill a function of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was qualified, I mean he was qualified under law to be a scholar, to be the teacher, to, to enforce the laws. But yet God called him out of that job, out of that duty, to become a minister. And let's just say like in the beginning, he didn't actually really qualify for that. He didn't really qualify. 
I, I think his pastoring was probably lower than mine on the spiritual gifts test. It was probably really, really low. Paul, Paul was more known for his apostleship. Apostles, a true apostle is called to plant churches, to start works, raise up pastors, move, put that pastor in charge and move on. But he was a minister. It's the Greek word public servant. It's the litugran. It's, it's a Greek word. He was a public servant. The word minister means public servant. But he wasn't a public servant. He wasn't a minister to the church. He wasn't a minister to the Jews. He was actually a public servant to the Gentile. The Gentile was the unchurched. The Gentile was the sinner. The person far from God. That's who Paul was commissioned as a lieutenant, as a public servant to preach to. The sinner. I think Ultimately, church has kind of gotten far away from the vision that God originally set. Church at large has kind of come to a point where it's a training center for Christians instead of a refuge for the unbeliever to find Christ. This was part of Paul's priestly duty was to carry out the sacred things, the work of sacred things. So he was a minister called to carry out the work of sacred things in proclaiming the gospel or proclaiming the good news. The word gospel, when we break the word gospel down, and this is another one of those things that just becomes an argumentative point across churches. The word gospel means too good to be true news. Literal definition. Too good to be true news. That the gospel of Jesus Christ the grace of God, unearned favor, unmerited favor, is too good to be true news. It's not just the good news, it's too good to be true that him who knew no sin became sin that I might be made the righteous of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. It's too good to be true that I did not have to hang on the cross to earn heaven. This is what Paul came to to preach. He introduced God to the Gentiles. He was preaching a too good to be true news to the sin sinner world who did not have access to God because they were not of the bloodline of the Jews. There's a lot of people today who still feel that they're too bad for God. Maybe you're watching online today. Maybe you accidentally came across this feed and you're saying, I could never walk into a church. Oh, the, the roof would cave in. First, we had a problem there because God's not going to cave in the roof of our building because of you. Amen. All right, that's just ridiculous. And secondly, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. And, and you want to know, you know, know what that really means? While we were in the very act of sinning, in the middle of the act of sinning, well, you know, this person, well, well you know, they have a sinner lifestyle. We all do. Amen. We all do. Amen. You're bad coming on Facebook with sin. You're overeating last night at dinner with sin. Your lack of faith this morning when you got up with sin. I mean, let's just call it what it is. While we were in the very act of sin, Christ died for us. Amen. There's nobody who can live good enough to earn the sacrifice. That's the too good to be true news. And this is what Paul came to preach. And he came to preach it to the Gentile world, to those who knew they could not access God. And this kind of serving that Paul was preaching, it was revolutionary. It, it took him 14 years to fully get that revelation and begin to learn Jesus and to learn the ways of the gospel. He began to pen it, put it on paper, and write it down so that we could all begin to serve others 
in a practical way. Listen, if the church ever gets to the point that they believe that they have something that others don't have, then we miss the point. I heard a very famous atheist say this statement. He said, how much must Christians hate people? Hate, he used the word hate. To believe that you have the truth, you have the answer, and not tell others about it. Because the truth of the matter is only 2% of Christians ever show their faith. So how much must Christians hate people to think that we have the answer to eternal life and not share that faith with other people? You see, the grace to serve is the grace to serve practically, practically, on an everyday natural basis. Like, the, 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 the basis would be like, you see somebody who can't afford lunch, buy them lunch. Serving practically. But then there's another step, another step. The grace of serving is the grace of serving spiritually, spiritually. And this is seen in Romans 12, 1 through 8. Romans 12, 1 through 8. Now, we may not like this one, Romans 12, because it takes some work. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, I urge you, I beg you. Beseech is a big word. I beg you. I'm, listen, this is what it looks like. Beseech, the actual definition of beseech, I beg you. I beg you, I'm kneeling before you in all humility, begging you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Can I break this one down? Because I know that we could all get like real guilty real quick about this one. You have been given one life. And this life that you were given was placed in a temple called your body. What are you going to accomplish in your temple in this one life? Some of us have stalled in our mission of life. Some of us have gotten comfortable in our mission of life. And Paul is kneeling down begging us in this one life that you have, that God has entrusted you as a servant of the kingdom of God. What are you going to accomplish in this body, in this one life that you have? He says, present it as a living sacrifice. Put it into service. Put your body into service for the kingdom of God. Watch. And do not be conformed to this world. The world is going to reach success and it's going to pause. It's going to complete its job and it's going to retire. And when it retires, it's not going to refire. I love retirement. I think retirement's great. I'm looking forward to it. But that don't mean that I'm done. Amen. That means I got a new mission. Amen. I got a new season. I got a new task ahead. It means I did my job. I handed it off to the next person. And now I'm beginning the next leg of the race. Amen. Come on. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Watch, he goes on to say in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, how did he get it? Through the grace. I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, man, don't play yourself. This way saying, don't play yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself than you ought. But think soberly, as God has dealt to each one of us the measure of faith. He's saying, we're all equal. We got one measure of faith. We got one measure of faith. Don't think you got more faith than somebody else. 
There's one gospel, there's one grace, there's one Lord, there's one faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. We are all members of the body of Christ, but we have different functions. So we being many are one in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing from one another. If one prophesies, let him prophesy in proportion to his faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches, teaching. He who exhorts, in exhorting. He who gives, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Now this is just one passage that lists gifts, spiritual gifts. Like I said, next week we're going to talk about all of them and we will make the gift test available to you. But he says this, that this kind of serving is serving spiritually. When we step into this realm, we're serving spiritually, and serving spiritually is expressed in three ways, okay? Serving according to the spiritual guidelines in verses one and two, let me read it again, verses one and two, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, Okay? Serving, listen to me, serving is not a matter of just doing an activity. There's a lot of us who have signed up to do tasks in life because we felt like we needed to check off the serving on our list. It's not a matter of just doing an activity. Serving is an expression of a life presented to God. <laughs> serving is an expression of a life that has been presented to God. Lord, my life is one of service, not just one task of service. Did we get that? That I should be available to serve anytime I'm called upon. Not when I say, well, you know what? I serve at Christmas time. I'll ring the bell at the mall. But that's about as far as I'm gonna go. That's not... That, can I tell you this? When you do things like that, somebody coming up and saying, man, you're doing such a great job, that was your reward. When you do an activity to be seen and to check it off your list, that was the reward. You didn't, you didn't store that one up in heaven. That was not an eternal reward. That's gonna be one of those things that are gonna be burned up in the fire. We're like, man, I did so many great things. And Wait a second. <laughs> it's an expression of a life presented to God. Service is a response to worship. And when I say worship, I'm not talking about what Pastor Chris just did. Service is a response to a worship to who God is in your everyday life. When you wake up in the morning, who is God today? Because when you wake up in the morning, the Bible says that his mercies are new towards you every morning. There's a new plan. There's a new mission. There's a new cleansing. There's a new mercy. There's a new grace every single morning that you wake up. Service is a response to worship. Service expresses sacrifice. David said this, I will not bring a gift that costs me nothing. I will not bring a worship that costs me nothing. A worship that costs you nothing is a worthless sacrifice. It's a borrowed sacrifice. Yeah, this is good stuff. You gotta go back and watch this online. Us, an offering that you bring that costs you nothing is worthless. In fact, it could even be stolen. Don't offer a stolen worship. Karen, don't be stealing worship. Don't be doing that. Service expresses sacrifice. That's why it's called, I offer up a sacrifice of praise. 
I offer up a sacrifice of worship. It's going to cost something to serve. And then number three, service is devotion. Service is devotion. Here's what those three things are not. They are not a duty, they are not a job. They're not a task. It's not, service is not something that we're called to do. Servants are something we're called to be. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I know. It's the lifestyle that a Christian is supposed to adopt. When we come together to worship, the deciding factor on whether or not we truly experience worship is seen in what follows worship, not in the moment of worship. We talk extensively about um, like after a team camp or after a women's event or after a men's event, we wanna see, was it a successful event? And, and we say, well, we gotta come back and look at this three to six months later to see if that event was successful. Because did it produce what we intended it to produce long term? Okay, so just because you got chill bumps during a worship set doesn't mean that it produced its intended effect. What happens after? After a Sunday when you're like, man, that word was so good, I've gotta call my friend and tell him about that. That's the intended response to worship. I need to serve somebody by telling them the word I just received. That's the intended response. Serving others. He goes on to say, serving others according to a sober spirit. This is verse three. He says, serving others according to a sober spirit. A sober spirit literally just means sound judgment. Making wise choices in serving others. It is so easy to get your emotions mixed up in the wrong way. It is so easy to get your emotions mixed up in serving in the wrong way. I've been in church a long time. My entire life I've been in church. And we've started programs and we've ended programs. And when somebody attaches, and I'm, I'm really treading very lightly on what I'm about to say. When someone attaches their identity to a serving position, or they attach their identity to a program that the church has, and then that program ends, it's very easy for that person to get upset and disgruntled and want to leave the church. Because instead of saying, I serve the Lord, this is my area of ministry. No, no. Our area of ministry is Christianity. Your area of ministry is called saint, child of God. Your area of ministry first is your home, your household, raising your kids and, and, and having a relationship with your spouse. Then it is to your neighborhood. That's your ministry. Not what I do on stage. What I do on stage is 1% of my serving ministry. 1%. Sound judgment. He's saying, so don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Don't think, don't think that everything that you do is all about you. I was in one of uh, Pop Hagen, um, Kenneth Hagen's last Bible classes that he taught before he passed away. And he got up on stage. That dude was reckless. He got up on stage and he had a, a glass of water. And he was preaching on this message and he says, Y'all think you're called to be pastors? Y'all think you're gonna have mega churches? Yeah! You know, like we're all, we're all Bible students. Like, yeah, we got mega churches. We're gonna have faith churches. He takes his finger and he puts it in the cup of water. He says, you see how I'm making a hole in this water? We're like, yeah. He's like, that's you. That's you in your calling, in the ministry, in the church. He pulled his finger out. He said, where's the hole? I filled in. Exactly. Jesus Christ will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When you think 
that you are the one thing holding the church all together. When you think, if it wasn't for me, this church wouldn't be where it's supposed to be. If it wasn't for me, the band wouldn't be where it's at. You already missed the point of what you were called to do. The true calling to ministry is you should be actively looking to replace yourself daily. Who's taking your place? Sound judgment. This is, what, this is what this whole thing says. Be sober. According to a sober spirit, sound judgment. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought, but according to God's measure that he has placed within you. How has he given you the grace to serve and to extend your faith? How has God called you to extend your faith? Serving, he says then, according to your spiritual gift in verses 6 and 7. He says there's gifts that have been placed in the church. And he wants us to serve according to the gifts that were given to us. I just want to ask you today, just throw this out there. I'm going to close my eyes when I say it. Are you using your gift to serve the kingdom of God? If not, why? And that's not like a disappointed why. It's a motivational why, like we need what's in your gifting. Each of us has a spiritual gift, a grace gift. Seven are listed in this passage. Put them on the screen. Prophecy, serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, administering, and showing mercy. Mercy's on my number 15. It's the lowest one I have, mercy. And I'm not praying for the Lord to give me mercy because to give me mercy, then I have to have my mercy tested. And then I have to say what Jesus said, tempt not the Lord thy God. <laughs> Our best service will be rendered to the knowledge of the spiritual gift that has been given to you. That's why I think it's important that we all know it. We do offer the spiritual gifts test, but it's after our FAM Foundations course. We want to put people in the right position serving in the local church. But beyond serving in the local church, how are you serving your community? How are you serving at your job? If you knew what your spiritual gift was, you could harness that even at your job and become a better employee. What is the gift that God has entrusted in you? Remember the story of the talents that a master gave three of his servants, talents according to the measure that they could handle? The, servant, the master came back and he says, all right, it's inspection time. What did you do with what I gave you? And I think that's what God's going to ask. When we stand before him, he's going to say, hey, what'd you do with the gifts that I gave you? What'd you do with the talents that I gave you? What'd you do with the spiritual gifts? What did you do with that information that I placed inside of you? Did you hide it or did you harvest it? What did you do with the gifts? Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about that today. Next week, next week, next week, next week, all right? Number three. Big three points. Third one is this. The grace of serving is the grace of serving corporately. Corporately. And this is best seen in Galatians 2, 9 through 21. We're not going to read all of that today. But in verse 9, Peter, James, and John gave the right hand of fellowship to Paul and Barnabas in serving Christ. One of Pastor Chris and I's vision moving forward is to collaborate with other churches in the area in worship, in the realm of worship. Collaborating with worship teams and, and, and with the college that we're bringing here, one of the main studies is going to be a bachelor's of worship where we will begin to raise up the next generation of worship pastors and worship leaders. Uh, we wanna put a studio together so that we can record in-house worship albums and, and worship songs that are written here at Family Church. A vision, dream, passion of ours. But we can't do that if we ourselves continue to hold animosity and things against other churches. Galatians 2.9 says this, and when James, Kephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, 
they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They said, hey, listen, man, we recognize we're on the same team. Same team. Maybe we can do something amazing together. Maybe we can do something great together. The grace of serving sincerely, sincerely. In Galatians 2.11, it says, now when Paul had come to Antioch, I stood with him to his face because he was to be blamed. Ouch. Ain't nobody like accountability. Ain't nobody like, hey, we missed it here. We missed it here. That's our Monday morning meeting. Every single Monday morning, all staff, round table. What did, how did we win this weekend? And where did we miss it? And it's never a finger pointing. It's here's where we missed it. Here's how we can get better. But if we're going to serve, we have to be able to have those conversations. I know nobody likes confrontation. I know nobody likes conflict. But if we could like kind of reword it and call it feedback, feedback to move things forward, one of our core values of staff is called make it better. Make it better. How can we make next weekend better than this weekend? How can we make the next event better than the previous event? And this is what Paul was, uh, Peter was doing here. Peter is serving in the fear of others. He's separating himself. And, and someone has to come and say, hey, you're, you're missing it, man. You're missing it. And we should be able to serve each other that way. I talked to my team. I was like, listen, we're not doing mom and dad stuff here. You're not gonna come to me and complain about another staff member. We're not doing that here. If something went down where someone didn't pull their weight and they didn't get their job done and put you behind, you need to go to them and you need to tell them that they need to get the job done so you can get your job done. But you're not coming to mom and dad. That's not how we're doing this one. Right? And this is what he's saying here. We have to be able to serve one another by keeping each other accountable to our individual callings. Listen, I'll tell you right now, how could this look? You could go up to somebody who you know has an amazing gift that the church needs to say, hey, how come you're not using your gift in the church? How come you're not singing on the worship team? How come you're not mixing audio with the, with the, with the sound team? How come you're not taking photography because you're an amazing photographer? How come you're not taking over the church's social media platform because you got a gazillion followers? We know each other better. How can we encourage each other towards service? I'm about halfway through my notes, so we're just gonna close right there. My encouragement to you today is this. There is a gift in each and every one of you. From the beginning of time, when Jesus came into the world, one of the first things that the Bible accounts for is that after Jesus was born, he was brought gifts. He was brought gifts. It's an indicator of gifts being brought into the body of Christ. You are those gifts. You're the gift every Sunday that gets brought into the body of Christ, that the church is responsible to care for and to nurture and to equip and to promote and to move forward. How can the church best serve you in the gifting that God has placed within you? We need to begin to ask those questions. We need to begin to have those conversations. Because if there's one thing I know, and my, my, my highest spiritual gift is prophecy, if I could speak prophetically for a minute, I could tell you this, there's an urgency in my spirit for the times that we are in. There's an urgency in my spirit that we had, we had a good two years of time off, but it's time to advance the kingdom. It's time to advance the kingdom. There's an urgency to get those dreams that God placed in our heart. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to stand up here and say time is short and that God's coming for his church tomorrow. I'm not saying that. But there's an urgency. It's, it's the get your house in order. Get your, get your callings in order. Get your giftings in order. That, that that gift, that deposit that God placed in you, he's calling a withdrawal. 
he's calling a withdrawal from us. That he put it in you from the foundation of the earth when you were born as a child. He put a gifting within you that he knew that he was going to need at a maturity date. That there was going to be a season in which he was going to need that, that gifting that he placed in you as a kid. And he was going to have to call upon it. I'm calling out of you today. I'm calling out of you today the gift that God has put in you. This is the season that you were created for. This is the generation you were created for. If you're here today and you never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to offer that to you today, this free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're here today or watching online and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you'd like to today, would you repeat this prayer with me? And it goes this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you give me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you wave at me and say, hey, I prayed that prayer today. Anybody real quick as I look across the room, I prayed that prayer today. Awesome. Great, great. Okay. Uh, you too, we have that same starting point book right at the Welcome Center just outside uh, the doors if you are interested in that. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't really know about this church thing, God thing, Christianity, or anything that you just talked about. We have a book at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity and what we believe here at Family Church, and that same prayer that we just prayed is at the back of that book. Father, we thank you today that your mercies are new every morning and that you have placed your grace upon us. Your word says that your grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for what we've been through, what we're going through, and what you've called us to do. So Lord, I thank you that you have given us the grace to serve. Show us what our giftings are. Show us how we can serve the church, the global church, the world today, God. Help us to have a boldness to step out of our comfort zone and be who you've called us to be. Lord, I bless everyone in the sound of my voice today. They're blessed coming in. They'll be blessed going out. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.